We're going to be talking about how to have a spiritual workout. We're going to talk about building spiritual muscles and how uh, what God works into us, we will work out. So we're going to talk about having a spiritual workout. But this week, we're going to go on the other side of that, and we're going to talk about weakness, the secret ingredient for strength. Uh, when I was young in the Lord, and probably some of you can relate to this, uh, if you accepted the Lord, at, at a, I was not only young in the Lord uh, at 20, but young in life. And I really thought that I would become this super Christian by just doing certain practices, you know, prayer and Bible study and uh, uh, going to church and just doing all the right things as, as best I could do. And over time, I would just become this Christian Rambo, you know, just a, a real superhero for God. And it took me a long time to realize that even though I had certain strength which God uh, put in me, and he put certain strengths in all of us and abilities in all of us, that I had also um, weaknesses and a number of weaknesses that I had no power to overcome. And sometimes I hear from some of you about your discouragement and your failures and over your own inabilities, uh, your own handicaps, your own weakness in certain areas, and sometimes even sins uh, that are caused by uh, a, a certain underlying weakness. But I'm here to say today that God loves to use weak people. Amen. I, uh, as in preparing this sermon, you know, it's kind of interesting. When I put the Psalms together every week, sometimes I have in my head, uh, I'll think, oh, we haven't done this song for a while, so we're going to put that song in. Or there'll be a certain song that goes along with whatever we're going to be talking about, and I'll put that song in. But it always amazes me when I'm up here starting to sing these songs, how they all come together, how they all have the same kind of theme, and it really, I, never, I didn't plan, plan it that way, you know? So the Lord really wants to uh, hit us over the head today with this, and I have this book called 50 People Every Christian Should so Know, and Stephanie and I were reading it yesterday together in our devotion time, and we were reading about the great hymn writer from the 19th century, Fanny J. Crosby, and if, if any of you grew up in the church, you remember uh, various hymns, uh, and you'll see her name. She was a, a, a poet that wrote thousands and thousands of hymns. And we, and we were reading, she was born in Putnam County, New York, on March 24th, 1820. When Fanny was only six weeks old, she developed a minor eye inflammation, and the doctor's careless treatment left her blind. It seemed intended by the blessed providence of God that I should be blind all my life, she wrote in her delightful autobiography, Fanny Crosby's Life Story. And I thank him for the dispensation. The doctor who destroyed her sight never forgave himself and moved from the area. But Fanny Crosby held no ill will toward him. Quote, if I could meet him now, she would say, I would say, thank you, thank you, over and over again for making me blind. In fact, she claimed that if she could have her sight restored, she would not accept it. She felt that her blindness was God's gift to her so that she could write songs for his glory. Quote, I could not have written thousands of hymns, she said, if I had been hindered by the distraction of seeing all the interesting and beautiful objects that would have been presented to my notice. She wrote her first poem when she was eight years old, and here it is. Oh, what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. So weep or sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. Wow. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Wow. A weakness. A person with a physical weakness that God used. So we're going to go to Exodus chapter 3 if you actually want to follow along in your own Bible. I'll give you a second to turn there and then we'll pray before we come to the scripture. Exodus, just the second book of the Bible, Genesis and then Exodus. And the third chapter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. For it truly is a light unto our path. And um, it guides us and directs us and corrects us. It's our plumb line, Lord. When in the building of our character. And so we thank you, Lord, uh, for the instruction of your word. And we ask today, Father, that we not only hear what you have to say to us, but, Father, that you would help us to 
apply this to our everyday lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Exodus 3, and we're going to start in verse 7. And what we're looking at is that encounter that Moses had with the living God. And we all know that thing from the Ten Commandments, you know, the burning bush and all that stuff. So the Lord said in verse 7, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, maybe you've said that in your own weakness, looking at your own shabby self. God, how could you possibly use me? Well, Moses was a nice little Jewish baby boy who would have been aborted after birth. You know, that's a popular thing going on now in states. We, we don't want to just abort a child when they're two or three months old, but seven and eight months old, and then if the baby's born alive, well, maybe there's a little deformity, then the mother and her doctor will counsel together and decide, well, if this isn't going to be convenient, it's going to be tough for me to raise a handicapped child, and maybe it would just be better to let the child die. So it's not a brand new concept because it went on back in Egypt thousands of years back when Pharaoh had uh, seen the way the uh, Hebrew slaves had increased in number and they began to fear that if they went to war, if Egypt went to war with another nation and their slaves turned against them, they could defeat them. So we said, we have to do a little population control. So we will kill every Jewish baby at two years old and under. So Moses' mother hid him, you probably all know, and she hid him for a while until it became impossible to hide the baby. And then we all know that wonderful story that we remember way back in our Sunday school days, if we attended Sunday school, where Moses' mother took a basket and covered it with pitch, sort of a waterproof uh, substance, and put little baby Moses in there, and then had his sister Miriam follow him as she placed the baby in the basket in the Nile and directed um, Moses, and I believe she did this purposely, toward the princess of Egypt, Pharaoh's daughter. And we all know how Pharaoh's daughter had one of her handmaidens bring that baby out of the water, and she said, I'm going to raise this child as my own, and she named him Moses because that meant coming out of the water. All right? So now you learned something. So now Moses had an Egyptian mother, and he had his Hebrew mother who came to nurse him for a while until he was weaned. So, Moses had two mommies. See, that's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> Moses had two mommies. You know what I'm talking about. But in Egyptian, it would be two mummies. All right. So, he was raised, we know, a prince of Egypt. He grew up in the palace of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is basically just means king. And he had a pretty good life for the first 40 years. He was a big deal, but he knew he had a calling. You know, sometimes you and I, when we walk with the Lord, we know God's called us to do something. And so he really knew he was going to be the deliverer of Egypt. So at 40, when he saw an Egyptian slave driver beating a Hebrew slave, he took that matter into his hands and he killed the Egyptian slave driver. And he then had to run and flee because Pharaoh was going to kill him. So he ran into the wilderness, as we know. He ran to a little town or a little place or a little village called Midian. And he married. And we know he had at least one son. And then he spent the next 40 years, not as a prince of Egypt, but herding sheep, being a, a shepherd. And so it was quite a, a change. And God used that time to develop him for his purposes. So four decades, and that's a long time of tending sheep, got all that Egyptian ego out of Moses 
And now God was ready to use him, and Moses says, who am I? See, as long as we think we're really something, and we have something to offer God, and something to offer the church, we're really not in the place where God can really, really use us. In my years of ministry, 15 years as pastor, I can think of a number of people. I think of one person in particular. The first Sunday they were here, uh, we were strangers to each other. But he took me aside and he told me, I've been a Christian pastor many years. And he said, I'm struggling with this area. I've got a weakness and I can't seem to shake it. And I thought, wow, this is somebody God can really use. Because they've come to the point in their lives where they realize that they're powerless. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of people that God can really use. Yeah. So, Moses says, who am I? And then we skip ahead to chapter 4 in this interaction between Moses and God. <coughs> and we read this. Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servants. I am slow of speech and tongue. Somebody just said that today in our, we're gathering in a circle. They, they said, I'm not, we'll pray sometimes publicly, but right now I get tongue-tied. Well, this is what the New Living Translation says, Moses said. He said, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. So verse 11, the Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. But Moses said... Oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it. Man. I mean, he really confesses to God, I'm weak. Who am I? What can I do? See, usually we, you and I, especially Americans of the Western world, we deny our weaknesses. We defend them. We excuse them. We hide them. We resent them. I know in my own life, I did all of those things, all of the above. Hid, excused, <laughs> you know, didn't like it. But Moses lays all his weaknesses out before God. Do you think God didn't know Moses' weaknesses? Do you think he, you know, God sees us in the shower, people. God knows everything you are, everything you have, everything you're not, you know. And this is exactly why God chose him. He wanted to make Moses aware that you need my strength. You know, to us it would make more sense. Why didn't God call him at 40 when he was so full of himself and boom, ready to go? You know, it's like the bumper sticker that says, hire a teenager while they still know everything, you know? <laughs> ah, so, we all know what the Lord did through Moses in spite of his past that he murdered a man in spite of his handicaps that he was not a good speaker and even in spite of his reluctance to even do what God was calling him to do every one of us has weaknesses and imperfections and sometimes it's a physical weakness like Fanny Crosby's blindness or it's emotional problems or it's intellectual issues you know not every one of us is a Mensa member. Not everyone's a genius. You know, God gives us different levels of intelligence. And sometimes it's, it's a spiritual weakness. God has never been impressed with strength and self-sufficiency. In fact, he's drawn to people who are weak and who admit it. Jesus addresses all of us weak people, and we all are weak. You know, we always say in that little Sunday school song, Jesus loves me, yes I know. Well, the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. I never like to say they are weak. I like to sing, we are weak, but he is strong. Yeah, we are weak, even when we're not so little anymore. <laughs> but Jesus addresses this in his, what they call the Sermon on the Mount, but it was really a seminar on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 3, what we call the Beatitudes. The very first one, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we realize we are weak, when we are empty, that's when we come to Jesus. And I believe also when we stay in that frame of mind, that these are the kind of people Jesus can really use. We're putty in his hands. The Bible's filled with examples of people that God used in spite of the fact that they weren't perfect, that they were ordinary, 
but God called them to do ordinary, extraordinary things in spite of their weaknesses. Think about Samuel. You know, we talked about Samuel a while back. And Samuel, if, if you know the period of judges in Israel's history, before they had kings, they had 200 years of leadership through judges. And Samuel was the last of Israel's judges, and he was the first of Israel's prophets. And Samuel was the one man we can look at in the Old Testament that's very hard to find any kind of weakness or sin. He was a really wonderful example of a man devoted to the Lord. But he anointed the first king, Saul, and Saul messed up. So God said, I'm taking him off the throne. His, his uh, descendants will not be used. And I want you to go to Jesse's house and anoint one of his sons. So Samuel heads to Jesse's house. And he sees uh, Jesse's first son. And this is what we read in 1 Samuel 16, 7. Uh, he first of all says, Surely when he saw Eliab, his eldest son, he said, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. He looked at this guy. He was tall. He was handsome. He looked like a king. And he says, This has got to be the guy. And the Lord says this to him in, verse, in chapter 16, verse 7 of 1 Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, in the same way that none of us can see what's going on in our own bodies, but now we're living in an age where there's various medical equipment where they can see all kinds of things that we cannot see just looking at the outside of the body. You know, all that equipment will reveal something that man can't see. And God has that same sort of vision to be able to look at our hearts and our potential. And sometimes even we ourselves cannot see what God sees in us. And we certainly have a hard time seeing what God sees in other people, now don't we? <laughs> so, God looked at the heart. And after Samuel has gone through seven of Jesse's sons, and each one God says, no, he's not the right one, he's not the right one, he's not the right one. We see Samuel saying this. There's only one son left. Only one son left. And we could call him the boy least likely to. 1 Samuel 16, 11, So he, Samuel, asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? Uh, well, there is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's out tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in he was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. Now David, folks, he, he's just a kid. What experience would he have to lead a nation? He's just out with a bunch of sheep. But God's using that time in his childhood and into his adolescence to train him. And God has more training in store for him. But he's anointing him way back there. I can relate to that because I knew God called me when I was 23. But God had so much to get out of me before he could use me in any way. So he took a few decades to get me straightened up. So that's the way it is with David. Now we're talking about in weakness. We're not talking about a chronic sin. But we are talking about a weakness that can cause you to sin. Sometimes that's the underlying issue. That, that causes you to, to do drugs, do alcohol, uh, sexual promiscuity, pornography. It's, sometimes it's, it's lack of self-esteem. You know, some weakness in you that causes it. And don't we love the stories of the ne'er-do-well that makes good? Like Rocky, remember? Rocky, you know, kind of the over-the-hill boxer. Nobody knows about him in and, and Philadelphia. And then we all know the story and how we drank all that raw egg in the morning and then started running around all over Philadelphia and up those stairs and he did that thing, you know. We love it, right? Don't we love it? Yeah. The loser in high school that nobody paid any attention to comes back 20 years later to the reunion and he's suddenly somebody. Yeah, we love that. The nerd that marries the prom queen. Yeah. I think about Condoleezza Rice a number of years ago. Stephanie and I were at a conference and she was one of the speakers. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. 
And there's a black girl who's basically in my age bracket who grew up during the 50s and 60s, uh, not only a, a, a black girl, but a, but, but a female. You know? And as she says herself, she, she was not able to sit at the lunch counter in Montgomery, Alabama because she was black. And she rises to become Secretary of State under George W. Bush. And I love the fact that she, that she was able to talk about that without bitterness, able to talk about it more with wonder of how God could take somebody that nobody would have expected years back and bring them up to that kind of level. Amen. And it's not that she, these were imperfect imperfections in here, it's just that that's what society at that time, back in the 60s and 70s, those opportunity, opportunities just were not happening. So if God used only perfect people, there'd be nobody to use because none of us are flawless, right? When you think of a limitation in your own life, you might be tempted to say, God can never use me. But let me say this. God is not limited by our limitations. I'm going to say it again. God is not limited by your or my limitations. Many in this congregation are 50 and over. And so you think age might be a handicap. My Dutch friend Rita, I met her way back around 1977. She was in her late 30s then, had come out of show business, found Jesus in a Chinese restaurant in Florida, <coughs> and was new in the Lord. And over the years, I've watched her uh, mature in the things of God. And for many years, she's had a dynamic prayer ministry, a prophetic prayer ministry. It's not for sissies. She just turned 80. She's going strong. Still at it. Or I think about the Ten Boom sisters, Corey Ten Boom, that was in her mid-50s, living a very quiet life. She was a lady who never married. Her sister Betsy never married. When we first hear about her life, they're, both the sisters are in their 50s. Corey's about 54. Lead, leading this quiet life, she works in her father's watchmaker shop. She, um, her sister tends the house. They live with their aged dad. They're living this quiet, again, Christian life. She, uh, Corey teaches the Bible to uh, mentally handicapped children. And then the Nazis move in and they occupy Holland. And then Corey and her sister become involved in the Dutch underground and begin to hide Jewish people, try to get them out of harm's way. And they even hid a bunch of, children, a bunch of Jewish people in their home and fed them and took care of them. Well, eventually one of their own Dutch uh, people turned them in. And the Ten Boom people, family went to prison camp. Their father, who was 83 or so, he died within a few weeks of being in prison camp. Mm -hmm. Corey and Betsy ended up being sent to Ravensbrook, one of the most deadly, cruelest uh, camps, if, if, there, if you could even uh, give a degree of cruelty, in these death camps. And they were in that camp a year, and while in there, they were teaching Bible studies to these women and leading many of these women to Jesus before they went into wow. the furnace and gave their lives. Wow. Betsy died in the camp and a week later Corey was released through a clerical error. When she returned to Holland before the war was over, people she knew didn't even recognize her. She had her body had been so ravaged by the cruelty in the camp. But after the war was over, Corey now in her mid fifties, people would consider in those days, man, you're we're way over the hill. She went back into Germany and began to help the German people who have been defeated uh, learn of forgiveness, learn of God's love, help them to get back on their feet. And then she spent the rest of her life traveling the world and evangelizing and li lying sometime in mud huts, other times in nice beds. And this went on for decades and decades. And finally, in her 80s, she became known to the world through her book and eventually a movie called The Hiding Place that told of these ordeals. But imagine being used to that degree by God when you, you know, have, have, you're an old lady, you know, basically. Especially, like I say, in those days, 50-something was really considered old. Now, of course, we know 50 today is a new 30, and 60 is a new 45, and 70 is a new 57. And then I always say, well, then when you get to death, what is that? Now, death is a new 90. I don't know how that works. But, you know. So, uh, this is what... The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. He says, we have this treasure 
That is Christ. That is our salvation, our relationship with the Lord. We have this treasure in jars of clay. So, to show that all this surpassing power is from God and not from us. See, Paul compares us to, do you ever have anything clay, like clay pots that you put flowers in? Or some of the Mexican pottery that's just made out of clay and you just tap it against the wall and it crumbles. You know, we all, and that's what Paul compares us to. We are just pots of clay. And we all have cracks. You and I are crack pots. <laughs> but the thing is, when Jesus is in us, the light is shown through those weak, cracked areas. Amen. Through our flaws. So, in the few minutes we have left, yeah, I might as well keep you here until two. Um, <laughs> okay. I see who the weak ones are in this place. <laughs> Carol down front. Ooh. <laughs> okay. I know, if you were in the Catholic Church, you'd have been out 17 minutes ago. Right? <laughs> uh, had your wafer. Had your wafer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Had that little eight-minute homily. Yeah. All right. A uh, few minutes, I want to talk about how you can allow God's power to be revealed through your weaknesses. First of all, admit your weaknesses. I remember attending this charismatic four-square church up in Henderson when I was in my 20s back in the 1970s. And they had a dynamic time of worship. And the people would have their hands in the air and they'd be singing and praising God. And it was really powerful. And I would look around and I thought, all these people, they have all got it together. They all have it figured out. And I am the only one that has some major broken areas in my life. You know? And then in that church and many others I attended over the last 46 years, I would hear the pastors kind of letting us in on their weaknesses by t telling how they had gotten angry over a situation in traffic. You know? Like we all do. Yeah. yeah. Somebody flips you off on 95. Yeah. Many of us don't feel like saying, God bless you. No. <laughs> In fact, none of you do, really, if you're honest. And I would hear them tell these little stories, and I would think, I have, oh, I'm so much more broken than that. I mean, tell me something that's going to help me, you know. So, you know, I, I discovered that. Again, it took me a lot of years to realize that these weaknesses are exactly where God wants us. Yet the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest men of God, probably the greatest example of a man that followed Jesus since Jesus, or beside Jesus, he wrote of his own weakness. And he says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. He says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. See, God gave him revelations. God will do things in every one of our lives that, that could make us feel a little bit puffed up. Sometimes, even as Christians, after we walk with the Lord a while, we become a little pharisaical. We look at other people and say, oh, isn't that, the, isn't that terrible? No. So he says, to keep from becoming conceited, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Now, every time I used to read that, I would think three times. Three thousand times. A lot more than three times I prayed. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul goes on to say, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now we don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Some people think it was a physical thing. His eyesight wasn't good. We find that in certain letters. Some people think it was agony over his past. That he had persecuted the very Christians he was now a part of. And, and had some put to death. Stood and watched Stephen get stoned to death. Uh, maybe that was haunting him. Others think it was the persecution he went through, predominantly from his own people, the Jews, but also from Gentiles. But the Holy Spirit keeps it secret from us so that we say, well, maybe Paul's weakness was the exact same thing that I deal with. My healing over emotional issues years back began really in earnest 
when I admitted my weakness. Yeah, I, this is it. This is what I deal with. So we want to admit our weakness. No, don't try to cover it up. Second, be content with your weakness. Second Corinthians 12 said, again, repeating what Paul said, Therefore, I will boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. And that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I thought what I went through was the greatest curse anybody could have and the greatest curse in my life, my helplessness. But it turned out to be one of the greatest blessings in my life. Partly because of what weakness does for us. I'm going to run through these quickly. First of all, weakness makes us depend on God. Weakness makes us depend on God. Years back our, uh, on our honeymoon, uh, Stephanie and I went to the Episcopalian church because our friend attended it. And she said her pastor had come out of drugs and alcohol. And I thought, i got to hear this guy because when you go from drugs to the pulpit, you've got some power. And I just never heard that kind of dynamic preaching because that's somebody who came out of a weakness. And you see power coming out of that kind of a person. And that's what made, gave me a hunger for God was really not that everything went well in my life or that I was strong in every area, but that weakness drove me to God. Secondly, our weaknesses also prevent arrogance. Paul said to keep me from becoming conceited because of these blah, blah, blah revelations. None of us can think we're better than somebody else when we look at ourselves and our own weaknesses. Thirdly, our weaknesses encourage fellowship with other believers. While strength breeds in an independent spirit, weakness draws people together. AA, Weight Watchers. Yeah. When you hear those other people in that room all talking about how they had to pass up a hot fudge Sunday, you can relate, you know. <laughs> support groups. And you know, the church really is just a big support group. That's why we're here. We need support. Vance Havner said this, Christians like snowflakes, I'm not talking about those college kids, I'm talking about this stuff. Christians like snowflakes are frail, but when they stick together, they can stop traffic. <laughs> Fourthly, most of our weaknesses increase our capacity for sympathy and ministry. We're far more likely to be compassionate to people when we know our own brokenness. And I know that's true in my life. I never struggle with alcohol. I never struggle with drugs. There are many things that I did not struggle with. But because of my own weakness, my own struggles, I have a heart for people who have a compulsion to do something that's screwing up their lives. Your greatest life messages and your most effective ministry will come out of your deepest hurts. The things you're most embarrassed about, the things you're most ashamed of, the things you're most reluctant to share are the very tools that God can use most powerfully to heal others. The secret I thought I would take to the grave has brought so much healing in other lives. When I've spoken places, nearly every place I've ever revealed my weakness, I've seen people with looks of gratitude in their faces. It's because they just need to know there's other people that are dealing with it. Wow. So we need to share your weakness. Aaron Andrews, the sportscaster and the host on Dancing with the Stars, for those who watch that, said admitting your weakness does not diminish your strengths. It shows your courage. So we need to delight in our weaknesses because people will find healings in your wounds. Hebrews 4.15 also says this, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Isn't that wonderful? That Jesus is able to sympathize with all these broken areas in our lives. Now before we close, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 26. And I'm going to close with a little reading that I think you'll enjoy. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, 
so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. I want to close with a little letter. This was addressed to Jesus, son of Joseph, the address, Woodcrafters Carpenter Shop, Nazareth, 25922. <laughs> it's from the Jordan Management Consultants. Dear Sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for managerial positions in your new organization. All of them have taken our battery of tests. And we have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. It is the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience in managerial ability and proven capacity. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. <laughs> we feel it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. <laughs> James, the son of Elpheus and Thaddeus, definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. <laughs> One of our candidates, however, shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen businessman, and has contact in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. Sincerely, Jordan Management Consultants. <laughs> I would close with Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that though we are weak, you are strong. Lord, help us to recognize the blessing of the broken, weak areas in our life. Help us to recognize when there are difficulties, it makes us depend on you, Lord. Help us to recognize, Father, it's through the very places that we're embarrassed of, that we're ashamed of, that we wish we didn't have, that you will use us in the same way, Lord, that you called Moses after you got that confident attitude out of him and brought him into a place of humility and dependence on you. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can, in Jesus Christ, do all things you call us to do. And we pray, Lord, that we would be a people with a strong sense of call from the Most High God. Lord, use this church for your purpose. Use each one of us individually in that outside world. And use us collectively to do great things in the city of Las Vegas. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, who is our strength, our power, our glory, and the lifter of our heads. Amen. 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 Amen.